try to pretend to remember the copyright. Tell me exactly how much we're paying. Let's show you. Oh, good. We're live. <laughs> so now we're ready. Nice to see you. We're gonna. I'm gonna try and keep us on time. Jen is trying to keep me on time. <laughs> Um, we are, um, hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Can people stop the conversations, please? I want to say hello to everybody who uh, is tuning in on the streaming. And Jeff Lebo, if you're out yeah, there, Jeff. from Korea. <laughs> What's up? Look, look, here we are. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> um, so you may remember, if you were here, what was the year? I think 2008. In 2008, Jen actually was here with um, her fellow compatriot, um, an ed tech talk chum, um, Jeff Lebo. And they were here talking with us about ed, te ed tech talk and about using Ustream and trying to build community. And, and it was a fabulous time. Does anyone remember back in 2008? Okay. Um, I, was I know nice. some of you were here. <laughs> and then, <laughs> or, I, know, I know it's a blur. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, I, Jen is here uh, with us again today in a different capacity, talking about a completely different subject that is uh, extraordinarily germane to all of us today, both um, you know as instructional designers, directors of online learning, and now with Open SUNY and um, the different the the focus that we have on experiential learning. And so I'm going to let uh, Jen introduce herself, but I'm very happy that you're here. Thank, Thank you, you for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm adjunct faculty. At at Old Dominion University, and I was just explaining to Eric my, uh, my scenario. I actually sit at home in Chicago. Old Dominion is in Virginia, and I teach students all over the place. So uh, I'm very much familiar with your world through uh, working with online students. And um, in the past year, I've set up a platform called Designers for Learning. And hopefully, if we have time, I don't have a huge focus on that during my session today, but hopefully when we get to the end, I can uh, bring you up to speed on some of the things I'm working on in that service learning platform. But my agenda today is pretty straightforward. Uh, I wanted to share with you my personal experiences with service learning. I've spent the better past, uh, part of the past 18 months talking to my colleagues, my uh, students, and um, friends that I were was stu a, a peer student with when I was in college, and who are now doing cool things with applied learning and service learning. And I'd like to meld all that in with the stories that you're able to share with me about things you're doing on, uh, applied, on the applied learning, experiential learning, service learning front. And then ultimately, what I want to do is create today. And so I went old school. And um, everybody, if you don't have one of these in front of you, <laughs> this is called a piece of paper, by the way. And you use a little instrument called a pen or a pencil to write at it. Um, what we're going to make today, we're going to design. And so through the, uh, the stories, again, that I'm uh, sharing with you about my experiences and my um, experiences of my colleagues, hopefully we'll fill this out and it'll be something that you can take with you when uh, you're working with faculty or you're designing your own um, classes. And it's been great. I had a great opportunity through the sessions I sat through today to get a general understanding. It seems like we have a mix of faculty, instructional designers. I'm an instructional designer by training. I have my master's and PhD in it. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm your people. <laughs> so I, I, I get it. Um, and that's why we have a, a plan, because instructional designers have to have plans, right? Uh, and then for those of you that, that want to be newfangled and use all the cool next technology, uh, I do have all my resources I'm going to be talking about today on a, um, on a Google Doc. And hopefully we don't break it, because we have a pretty big group here. And if we break it, I have another plan B to help us find stuff. Um, but everything that I'm talking about here today is stored on there, my presentation, my handouts, and so you can take it all with you um, as you go. So again, if you could kind of pull this and, and look at my little, <laughs> you have to have an icon with these types of things. So when you see the hand, that means we're going to grab our handouts. Uh, so before I start um, my story, I was, uh, would like to get a sense from folks what your experiences are with service learning. And I apologize. It's kind of a I'd like to be in the room, but I'm, I'm ending, ending up back, my back to everybody. But um, first of all, I'd just like to poll the group. Who in this room, and it's totally fine to answer yes to this, has never heard the term service learning before George mentioned it in his session today? Oh, really? Really? Because <laughs> no joke, 18 months ago, my <laughs> been up, uh, maybe two years ago, I had never heard the term service learning. 
Okay, exactly. I would have been there as well. So like I said, a master's PhD in instructional design, I had never really, I never really delved into what, what that term meant or the concepts. So how many have participated in service learning as a student? For example, in Amer AmeriCorps. Okay, great. That's what I'm finding. My niece was actually in AmeriCorps and um, she's been a great resource as I've been going through these things. Um, how about designing or teaching a service learning experience? How many in the room? Okay, handful of people, okay. Dozen, we'll call it. So hopefully you can share as we're going on uh, today and trying to build out this design plan. You can help share your stories as well. So I'll start my story at the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean really the beginning. Uh, this is a picture, probably the first picture <laughs> was ever taken of me in January of 1967. And um, I use this to frame the next few slides. My mom and my, my dad, whenever I would leave the house, they would give three sentences to, to send me out on my way. Same with my siblings. Uh, first was to be a good girl. Second was to have a good time. And the third was to learn a lot. And so there I am. I'm pretty sure that's my kindergarten picture, <laughs> maybe my first grade picture. And then there's my husband uh, when I'm getting my master's and my PhD. So I've really taken these three phrases to heart. And so when it came time to dedicating my dis dissertation, I dedicated it to my parents. And I said, their encouragement to always be a good girl, have a good time, and learn a lot. And so this will hopefully all <laughs> come full circle uh, when, we, when we move forward. But I, what I'd like you to do on your design plan is the very first thing. I'm assuming there are probably parents in the room, you were children of somebody, and you probably had similar well wishes as you were walking out the door. And if you wouldn't mind just taking a couple seconds and just jotting on the top of your paper what those wishes are. So just think about when your kids are running for the school bus or you're dropping them off at school, what are the types of things you tell them? And if you can't think of anything right now, you can borrow mine because I think it's a good one. <laughs> so uh, I don't think it's a bad thing to tell your kids, be a good person, have a good time, and learn a lot. So I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. So fast forward for four decades. We're now, now in my 40s. And I'm teaching my first online class at Old Dominion University. And it's a class called Consulting Skills for Instructional Designers. And it's an online class. And I do have the benefit of a virtual session. Adobe Connect is the, the tool and technology we have. But when I start digging into the description of the class and looking at how it was taught in a face-to-face -face environment, um, it's requiring students that the learning outcomes are asking students to interact with real human beings and work with clients to identify performance problems, uh, to guide a relationship. As all instructional designers know, I was laughing with the <laughs> commiserating. I shouldn't say laughing with those that kind of describe instructional design like pushing a string where you're trying to get people to do things. And so that's part of the, uh, the assignment, uh, is getting folks to work with a client who may, may or may not want to take your advice. And so the problem you have in an online setting is you have the student in, in many ways in a box on their computer, on their laptop, and then you have the rest of the world sitting out there with clients. And so I really struggled with this. I thought, how am I going to establish authentic practice opportunities for my students when they're in this box and then the rest of the world is, is out there and they somehow have to, have, um, have to reach them. So all the problems, and I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure, in, in this group, the, graphic, uh, the geographic and time separation is a huge burden when you're attempting to reach out and have your students engage in applied learning. You've got the issue of how they're going to find a client, how are they going to scope the project, how will I interact with them, how will I keep up with what they're doing. And so, I did my best, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it because it was my first experience. <laughs> There's more probably I did wrong than, uh, than I did right. But I, um, I basically put it in the hands of the students. And I said, please go out in your community. I gave them general parameters. And I just kind of tossed in there, you know what would be kind of cool is if you found a nonprofit that you could help. I just said, I didn't, you know, I didn't think much about it. But I also gave them the opportunity if you want to work with in your or own organization, um, please don't work within your own department, but maybe find another department that you could build some type of internal consulting relationship. And I basically let them go, and I had checkpoints, milestones, we had an, a blog, and I tried to use it as a project management tool. And it was okay. It, it worked, in my opinion, it was all right, for my first try anyway. But I actually um, talked to the students, and I asked them to give me their feedback on the experience. How did it go? And uh, I was pleasantly surprised to hear most of them saying this was the best learning experience I've had as a student. 
because I actually got to try it. And I got to see what the real complexities are. Um, it was messy. Uh, people didn't like what I was saying often. And um, I had to overcome it. And so they found that challenge rewarding. Um, they also, uh, particularly the woman on the left is Kay Rabel. She worked with a nonprofit, um, helping them to take their current online volunteer training and moving it to a face-to-face -face environment. And so she, in particular, felt that it was really rewarding to give back to an, an organization that she would volunteered with in the past. Um, and so, as I'm listening to this, and now this is tying back to our first item on our sheet here, so I was hearing the students saying they were learning a lot. I was hearing the students say that they were having a good time. It was, it was one of the best experiences they'd had. But more importantly, they were saying they felt they were doing good, <laughs> and that they were being good members of their community, and that they were giving back. And I don't know yet, to this moment, if that's a motivational factor. I don't know if that's going to help them ultimately in their learning. But it was something that I really had never heard a student say to me before when we talked about assignments. And so that's, again, tying everything back to, uh, to our first line. So I, I, as I said, this was my first time at this and trying it. So I decided I better really look into this and see what this is all about and find out what other folks have done. And I started doing the tr traditional Googling of applied learning. I looked up experiential learning. Um, and then I kind of stumbled, li literally stumbled on some writings on service learning. And I thought, well, gosh, this is really narrowing in on what I'm experiencing. I, I've got the academic coursework that we're checking that box. We're getting students out to get uh, real work experience, apply learning opportunities. But there's this little corner piece of the pie in the upper right hand uh, corner, this whole idea of the community service. And there was something just different and unique about it and I was getting that back from my students. And so as I kept looking, um, I said, okay, well that's, most of the writing that I was finding was in a face-to-face -face environment. What are folks doing? in an online environment, in a virtual environment. And lo and behold, there are some pioneers out there that are writing about, trying it and writing about it, and pretty much under the, the tag of e-service learning. And, um, and so if, I, in the resource packet that you have, I have a few uh, links to journal articles that have been published on e-service learning. And so I've reached out and I've talked to those folks as well, and I'll try to bring in some of their things that they talked about. Um, and so in the packet that you have, you'll just find it kind of what I'm calling an appetizer of all the resources that I've found on service learning that includes their entire journals, lo and behold, on community service and uh, service learning. There's a, a great base, as you would imagine. Twitter's great for bringing together networks. And in the packet of information I, I, I've given um, in the resources, there's a, a list that I have, a Twitter list that lists the, lists the 150 folks that I've stumbled upon and I follow now who are all interested in service learning. Uh, same thing with con their conferences, books, everything that you would, it's not probably shocking, except like I said, it was shocking to me because I didn't know it existed. But the most important thing I did, and this is really where I'm gonna spend the rest of my time, is I, as, as Alex knows, the reason she knows me is through webcasting. And so I fired up Google Hangouts on air, and I started talking to people. And so far I've done 15 webcasts in the last year. And so I'm going to use that as a backdrop to talk about some of the, the stories from my colleagues. So if you point your browser to designersforlearning.org, there's a section on there for webcasts, and you can see the roster of all my uh, 15 webcasts that I've had so far. So I talked to college faculty. I talked to administrators, students, nonprofits, even librarians, and of course, as you'd imagine, in peer instructional designers. And this all culminated in a platform, which I hope we have time to talk about at the end, called Designers for Learning. And, and it's a, a platform where I link instructional design students with nonprofits in need of work. And uh, again, I hope we have some time to talk about it. So what I'd like to do now, back to your, your story and, and starting to fill out some of your sheet and your plan, write down on the, on the piece of paper the title of your online class where you think there may be a place to in integrate service learning. And if it's not a class that you teach, maybe it's one that you're helping someone else design. And maybe if you guys could start shouting out, what are some classes where you think this may be something you could work on? Nobody? <laughs> Nobody has any applied? You, you got to help me out. For me, as a 40 some odd year English teacher, the most obvious thing, since there's lots of online writing instruction, is turn require real work like um, I did this, but I did it on site, so that's why I didn't raise my hand, Jen. Um, sorry. 
So, um, so I, I require that the students um, put their writing to real use. So some, for example, went to the Ann Arbor um, homeless shelter and did a survey of what they thought they needed for marketing materials to get better support in the community and other kinds of materials written in a different rhetoric to help people who are first getting the services of that community. So that they formed a group, they went out, they did that research, and by defining the audience and purpose, they defined what their writing assignments were. So it was easy enough to figure out a rubric for grading them. That's the course objective, obviously, right. is to learn to write better. Right, right. So then they used the skills and knowledge they were learning within their discipline to help as, as writers to help the nonprofit. Exactly, uh, and that could materials. be done online, but I didn't raise my hand because yeah. I, I taught it as an on-site course. Right, so any, anybody else want to share an example? We, uh, we actually do have an active service learning program in Oswego, and one of the stories my service learning director tells is the fact that uh, we've got a counseling graduate program, we've got a gerontology certificate, so connecting, you know, teens and 20-somethings to actually go out and work face-to-face -face with the elderly who will eventually be their clientele. Uh, you know, he tells the story about what a moving, powerful experience it is for our students to actually go out and, you know, face-to-face. -face. So it's, just, it's a face-to-face -face component, yeah. uh, but it's been really effective. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Janet Nepke, I'm doing lots of work with uh, experiential education, but I have questions about what you're telling us about your work. Is it considered to be an online course? Is it classified as an online course, first of all? Well, it, at Old Dominion? Yes. Like, they're very squishy on definitions um, because <laughs> I, I, it's technically under a distance learning. If you went to a, that section of the website, you'd probably see my course. But it, they still have the silo of instructional design. And I'm, so I'm just thinking that State Ed has requirements about what percentage of a program needs to be online in order to consider it a distance learning program. Oh, okay. So that's why I was wondering whether your course is classified as online. I'd also like to know. And, and, and if, if you go on, um, I'm just trying to think how the students register, they can register for face to face classes, and this one's considered a web class. So I guess it would probably be considered <laughs> a, an online class. So yeah. is it an entire class, or are your service learning activities part of someone else's class, as this gentleman? Was saying. It's 16 week course, so all mine. So and it's a credit bearing class. Three credits, graduate, PhDs, and master students, yeah. And I would love to see your method of evaluation. For assessing the students? Yes. Oh, we're going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we're, we're, we're just at the title stage where we're getting into awesome questions. Hopefully, we'll, we'll start rolling these in. So, the, uh, as everyone knows, and uh, instructional designers and educators, when you're starting to think about laying out your class, just start thinking about things we were talking about before desired learning outcomes. So if you're writing in an English program, you want to get your students writing. And so um, regardless of the service learning, kind of set that aside. Just try on your paper what the desired learning outcomes would be. And let's think, very, as we've talked about in George's session and some of the comments that were flowing through on Twitter when we're thinking about Blooms, let's really push the envelope and think beyond recall. recall. <laughs> let's think about uh, evaluation, application, creation. So what are some things that when that student is, has finished your class, you want them, he or she, to be able to do walking out the door. And so those are the types of desired learning outcomes. And so um, when I'm putting together my uh, service learning projects with my students, for example, some of the things that I think about, um, I want them to be able to do uh, um, an analysis. We talked about needs analysis that came up before. So I want to, I, that would be something that I would like them to have the opportunity to do an analysis. Uh, we're talking about the consulting skills class. I want them to feel comfortable building a relationship with a client and carrying it through. So for whatever your class is, whatever your example is that you have, uh, you know, please jot that down. And then tied to that uh, are the tasks, thinking about tasks within a nonprofit where they could use that. So as Eric, Eric mentioned, every nonprofit needs um, marketing materials written. So what, what I ask my students to think about, for example, I'm, I'll just read, up, read some things off staff training and development. All nonprofits have volunteers that need to go through orientation, um, customer education, the clients that they serve. There's usually some type of education that's needed, donor outreach and engagement, um, con converting face-to-face uh, -face courses to online. So those are the types of things from the courses I teach, but obviously, depending on what the title of your class is, what your objectives are, your tasks are going to be different. And so tying very much into what George was talking about and what Michelle was talking about a bit, um, and hers as well, is 
I'm, I'm really um, embracing the, the things I'm reading these days about getting rid of disposable assignments. I think uh, George referenced them as uh, things, assignments that go in the trash. <coughs> and so uh, within the resource materials, I've linked to one of David Wiley's blog posts where he's on a pretty, pretty full-fledged rant against disposable uh, assignments. And he's really asking us, calling <laughs> to the greater universe of educators and saying, uh, please stop assignments that add no value to the world. And uh, obviously that can't be every class we teach, we can't have fake scenarios <laughs> or whatever, but big picture, let's try to get students focused on real world problems, things that they're actually going to encounter when they get out in the real world, and do as best we can to facilitate experiences where they're able to do that. And so now switching gears back to what I was saying before with the um, webcasts I started. So this is actually Rick West, he had a baby this week. He's an awesome guy, he's a, a friend of mine, he's at BYU. And he's doing a lot of research right now on this whole idea of communities of innovation. And so if you go to the webcast page that I shared before, there are links to his work and to him as well. He's a great guy. If you're at all interested in thinking of ways to foster communities of innovation, I know we have communities of inquiry that we're all probably familiar with. That was part of my dissertation. But he's kind of pivoted a little bit and talks about communities of innovation where we're actually focusing on the products and how they're developed. Like create, how do we, as a society, create uh, innovate the next apple or whatever it may be. And so he's focused his research on that. And so in this whole idea of thinking about tasks for your students, let's, let's pivot a little bit and start thinking about those things, those real world problems, those real world tasks that we can engage them in with the nonprofits that we serve. And then also this is a great guy and I, I would think you would all be kindred, kindred spirits with him. He is the director of UM Online and UM is the University of Montana. His name is Robert Squires and he is right where we're all right now. He is directing a large scale online program, trying to think of ways to em embed experiential learning opportunities, applied learning, and I just had correspondence with him this week. He's trying to embark on a large service learning venture. So you may want to point your browser to him and, and try to figure out the work he's doing and follow along. He's a great guy. He'd love to reach out and talk to any of you at any time. So like I said, kindred spirits, meet, meet Robert, <laughs> Robert Squires. And then one of uh, your, your peers, I'm uh, one of the second, and if you notice in the upper left hand corner of the slides, that references the webcast. So she was in my second webcast. Her name is Christina Lambright. Um, she's with SUNY Binghamton. She's not an instructional designer. She's actually in public administration. And so she has done a lot of service learning in what I would consider a more traditional sense where um, it, it's not necessarily what I'm describing with my students where we're trying to find ways to consult with them. Um, and so when I was asking her then to help me understand the different, to differentiate between service learning and volunteering, she made a huge point that it's not the same thing. And it really boils down to this graphic that service learning really is a two-way street. You're asking the students to provide a service to the nonprofit in exchange for the nonprofit being willing and uh, agreeable to uh, facilitate and help the learning of your student. And that's a really big point. And when I go out and meet with nonprofits, I, I, it's, I, I, at first I was calling it a disclaimer, but now I'm saying really it's a, it's a requirement that you appreciate that you're there to help the, the student learn and, um, and that, be, that becomes really important when you're starting to lay out what the tasks are going to be because the nonprofit may want to think of your student as a volunteer and maybe want them to sit at the door somewhere and stamp hands or something like that. It's that idea of shifting away from that. They're a volunteer providing just you know, what you'd normally have a volunteer do to actually um, something that's helping supplement their learning. So now moving on to your sheet number five. Think about the nonprofits that you've volunteered with. Think about nonprofits that you've heard others work, work with. And, um, and jot, jot, just jot down on your piece of paper some nonprofits that you think may help, looking back at the first four items on your sheet, that may help you be able to deliver the experiences we're talking about with your students. And while this may seem like a daunting task, it's actually quite easy. And I've had no trouble once I've opened up, put out my shingle, finding willing nonprofits to work with. Um, and a couple sources where I first started to dip my toe in the water of this and trying to find nonprofits. I live in Chicago and like every community in America, um, they have volunteer expos. And so we just had ours last weekend where about a hundred nonprofits were all in a room at, a, at our nature arboretum or whatever. <laughs> And uh, they really had little their booths, and I literally walked around the room. I'll walk around the room and pass out my card and say, "I'm an instructor. Uh, is there any type of work that 
and again, looking back at your first four bullet points on your sheet, anything that would, uh, would fit this, and we start having a, a discussion and dialogue. Pretty soon, through friends of friends, I have more nonprofits than I have students uh, <coughs> to, uh, to help, help do the work. So that's one, area, one possibility. There are also great website resources such, a volunteer, such as Volunteer Match. Uh, and they're very much looking for volunteers, but again, it's just the idea of trying to get feelers for who is in, who's in your community, who's well-rated, who's well-respected, which ties into then uh, GuideStar as well as Charity Navigator are great platforms to try to get a sense for the quality of a nonprofit. Um, is it just someone that just started something up and they don't really quite know what they're doing, or is it, some, is it a more established um, nonprofit within your community? And then in the upper right-hand corner, I'm just going to table that for a second. It's, it's called Campus Compact. And I want to ask, has anyone worked with Campus Compact here in New York? Okay, good. So we'll spend some time talking about that in a second. Switching back to my webcast, um, the first webcast I had with, was with an awesome uh, friend of mine, Rick Schwer. He's at the University of Saskatchewan. And um, his best piece of advice to me is that the key to all this is establishing the right relationship, which ties back to what Christina was saying, that service learning is not volunteering. And so uh, what's really important is getting it from the get-go, this, this two-way street and, and setting that up. <coughs> and so if you have any time at all, I, I would probably encourage you to listen to that first webcast to try to get a sense for what Rick's been doing. He's been doing service learning for years. He's an online instructor, and um, he's found ways to incorporate it. And he does a nice job throughout the webcast of describing what he does, the pitfalls, and how to get out of the pitfalls. And so now back to your sheet. I'm um, thinking about the nonprofit client, um, or the, sorry, the location of the nonprofit client. You have a bunch of options. As I did with my class, my first class, I had the students go out and find something that was near to them. Conversely, you may have relationships on your own campus. You may have a um, community engagement department or whatever it may be that can help assist you. And with, again, within my resource packet that um, is online, I've provided some links to some SUNY specific things that I was just able to find. And pretty much without exception, as I was looking at the various um, SUNY campuses, I saw offices of service learning or offices of community engagement. And um, I'm, you know, I'm not familiar with all of them, but that's really what they're there for is to help you. And then um, there's also what, what I'm doing now in one of the projects I'm working with, the entire experience is 100% virtual. So it's actually, um, I've actually told the students you cannot go to the facility. facility. It's actually in a pretty s tough area in Michigan and we just want students not to go to the area, yet we still want the students to be able to, uh, to help out. So um, in, in thinking about the, uh, the location of the nonprofit, um, I spoke quite in, quite in depth with a colleague of mine, Molly Duggan. She is at Lenora Ryan University in North Carolina. And, um, and some of you can probably relate to this, depending on where, what you're thinking about for your first few bullet points here of what your class is looking like. Um, location may be more important for you than, than others. Uh, I think Alex, you and I were talking about a dental program, for example, where the students actually had to get their hands in the mouths of patients. Well, obviously, that would be a situation where 100% virtual would be difficult. And so as you're thinking about your class, it, it's going to be dependent on that. So there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer in terms of the location. And then in terms of the nonprofit engage engagement, the, the experience I described, I put a lot of the responsibility on the student to go out and do that. Um, some instructors that I've talked to really want to take full control of that so they can you know, lay out the experience. Um, and then there's also the ability to involve the, your, your campus, as I mentioned, the, uh, the office that you may have, which then ties into this slide. So this is the, the URL for the New York Campus, Con um, campus Compact. And Campus Compact is a consortium of 1,100 U.S. colleges all dedicated this idea of community engagement and community service. And so within the state of New York, you have an office. And um, I looked at the membership list, and it's just a huge roster of SUNY schools. So um, again, these are great resources for you locally to start tapping into. They have seminars. That I've, in Chicago, I'm in Illinois. I know the Illinois Campus Compact folks quite well. I've gone to some of their sessions that they've had at DePaul University and at Loyola. Um, and so they're great. It's just a bunch of kindred spirits uh, getting together, trying to figure out the best ways to accomplish these things. So this is a link for you for your local folks. And so on, on bullet point number eight, this is kind of a trick question. I've got on the bottom or the side there, it says yes or no. Um, I'm actually going to skip ahead here. I, almost without exception, everybody I talked to said always check the yes box. 
And so let's go over what this memorandum of understanding is. So this again is that whole building the relationship with your nonprofit. And so it is asking them to um, work with you to let, lay out, I, at first I called it a contract when I did it in my first couple classes. I didn't call it an MOU, I called it a contract. And it freaked everybody out. It freaked the students out because they thought, well, what if I don't do it, do I have to pay the money because I didn't do it? And the, the nonprofits are saying, does this mean I have to pay somebody? And um, so we now just call it a memorandum of understanding. But in a nutshell, it's laying out the rules and responsibilities of the re relationship. So what are the client's needs? What are the boundaries of the project? Um, and then you get into some of the squishy kind of legally things. For example, if you create something for the client, as you were talking about the marketing materials, who owns that? Does the student own that or does that, uh, is that be owned by the nonprofit? And these are big issues. In fact, what we tend to do is ask everybody to make everything Creative Commons. If, if we're going to do it for free, we're going to put it back out in the universe for everybody else to borrow and to use. And so, but these are just things you need to think about. And so I won't go through each bullet point that's all on your sheet, but confidentiality statements come into play. Uh, one of my students was working with um, uh, a shelter. And so even just getting out the location of the ad, you know, that's a, that's a problem. And so you just want that all laid out, that we, we appreciate and understand it, that we understand it, and, they, and, and they've told us what um, is important to them. So as I mentioned, I love this picture of Trey. He looks like he's going, yes. <laughs> he looks like he's actually telling us yes. Um, but he runs a consultancy out of his um, instructional design program at University of Memphis. And this is, a, if you're at all interested in, in possibly doing this yourself, he doesn't only cater to nonprofits. He also works with for-profit organizations and actually charges a fee. And that's how he funds his consultancy within the university. And there's all kinds of logistics and backroom things that are way beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But the whole idea being he wants his students as much as possible to understand what that experience is like once they get out in the real world. And so he's gone to that added step of setting up an actual instructional design consultancy right within the school. And so someone mentioned um, uh, earlier this whole idea of assessment and grading. And so to me, it all boils down to what you then, so you've got the, the memorandum of understanding with the client, and now switching gears, it's your contract that you have with the student. And um, I really like thinking about it in terms of a course contract. Because this is different than me giving you assignment as some, I think it was in George's <laughs> schematic today where he throws something out to them, they throw it back to them, and then it ends up in the trash. Well, this is totally change, turning that uh, dynamic around completely. And you're asking the student, and I have, I have my students write it to me, tell me what they plan on doing, who their client is, if it's one they've found, um, or even if it's one I've found, if, tell me back what you're hearing, this, your responsibility is. Uh, what's the context of the project? Uh, what are the client's needs? What are the goals? And then getting really into the devil, the details. What are the deliverables? What are you going to do? What task are you taking on? What are you going to create? What services are you, are you providing? And what are your milestones? And the last bullet point here is the student reflection parameters, which I'll tie into in a moment. But where this ties into the question that came up earlier about the, this is your rubric then. So at the end of the day, when the class is over, um, this is where you're going to go back and say, did you do this? Did you do these things? We'll talk about specifics of that in a moment. <laughs> and so, so far I've talked about mainly situations where it's a student working individually on projects. I certainly don't have time today <laughs> to think about all the dynamics involved with group projects, but everything that you work on as an instructor with groups applies here as well. And so when I had a, a nice conversation with Brent Wilson from uh, University of Colorado in Denver, he spent quite a, time, a bit of time during our session um, talking about the need for roles and responsibilities. And so I, I'm sure I'm talking to, preaching, again, preaching to the choir with this group. When you start getting into group projects, it's a bunch of new dynamics that, you, that need to be <coughs> figured out. Who's going to be the project manager? Who's going to be the client liaison? Um, those types of things need to, um, need to be talked about. And so this all sounds rosy and lovely, and <laughs> I'm telling you how great the experiences were. The students loved it. I can guarantee you will have this happen to you, where you get the deer in the headlights look from the student about a few weeks into it saying, OK, I thought I knew what I was doing, but then I actually talked to the client. And they're saying different words than you're saying. Um, they're now asking me to do something that I didn't, we didn't have in the memorandum of understanding. Um, and so that's, we were talking to Eric about this before, this is the messiness of applied learning that we need to embrace. 
and we need to be comfortable saying we don't have the answers. I, so when a student comes to me and says, why did they tell me they want more things? Well, I, I don't know why they <laughs> did that. But that's now your responsibility as an adult, as a uh, soon-to-be professional in this field, to work through those issues as part of this service learning and applied learning experience. And so how do you move past this? And the best thing I've found is to have um, a pretty good plan for project management. And here again is one of your, one of your people, your kindred spirits. She's in the e-learning office at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. Her name is Beth um, Oyorzan. And she's a, we were in a PhD program together. And um, so she's had this job for over a decade now. And uh, again, this whole idea of an instructional designer pushing the strings, she can very much relate to that. But one of her major initiatives within her program at UNC Wilmington is setting up applied learning experiences. And so the vast majority of our session I had with her, which was session three, uh, was talking about project management and how, the, how you work with the students, work with the client to manage this process all the way through because it will inevitably get messy and you will get deer in the headlights looks and your clients sometimes will go AWOL and these things happen. And so you just need to be able to have a plan in place to be able to get through it. And so I've laid out a few things for you to think about in this, this grand scheme of project management. First thing you need to think about is the student's process. So start thinking about what, what will they actually do? So as George was talking about sending his students out on the bus or whatever it may be, you kind of have to think through those and start thinking about, okay, where could they run into trouble? Um, and then you also have to think about your clients and where, where they may, like I said, go AWOL. They may go missing or they may decide that the scope you've set is too narrow and they want to broaden it. And so you have to start thinking about how you're going to address those things. And then the last bullet point kind of ties in with all of this. How are you going to stay informed? As I mentioned, it was, my class was an online class. Um, my students never came, looked me in the eye. I couldn't make sure I could see where things were going. And so I used the reflection component, which I'll talk about in a moment, to help me manage that um, as part of the instructor updates that I was getting. So now this is, to me, one of the most important, important parts. This is where the learning to me happens. Obviously the learning is happening as they're trying things and they're experiencing things. But it's really at that point of stepping back. And George had some really good examples of how he was having his students um, using text messages to report back. You, could, you know, the world is open. We've got technology all over the place and links and whatever. So um, the things you need to think about is what do you want them to report back on? When do you want them to do it? And where? So where it would be as George was using text messaging and what have you. Um, so let's kind of just delve through those real, real, quick, real quickly. Um, a good, good friend of mine who lives in Chicago now, um, name is Monica Tracy. She's an instructor at um, Wayne State University in their instructional design program, um, has written a few articles that are about to be published on reflection. So if you kind of keep put a little note by her name, and you may want to pull this up down the road, uh, the articles that are right now in press on reflection and how important it is to facilitate the student's learning and, and some of the tips and tricks um, that you can, uh, you, you should incorporate. So we'll go through some of those now. So in terms of what, um, as George just demonstrated today, their perceptions. So what, what are you seeing? How is it different than you expected? Um, progress summaries, which get into some of the project management things, the tally of their hours. It, are things taking longer than you expected, which you will always find? Um, and those students, that's kind of funny, back to the assessment thing. If students are telling you things are happening at the same time that they planned, then they're not really doing the job, and they're not really keeping good tasks. So it's, it's really those students are going, oh, wow, I thought it was going to take me 10 hours. It's actually taken me 40 or whatever the number is. And so you can use these reflections as an opportunity as an instructor to kind of get a sense as they're going through um, if their scope changes, uh, are there surprises, are there concerns. And so this is helping you from the project management standpoint, and it's also helping then your students think about what they're doing and how this is helping them. So when is always a, a big question in terms of re reflections. At a minimum, I like to have my students report back every week. I used a project management blog, which was very helpful for me to do that. George showed how he was kind of doing stuff on the fly as they, as they happen. Oh, you all also may want to do it at a milestone, um, at a point in the process. And then where? Um, this has really been an interesting question for me to ask all those co colleagues that I spoke with. Some are adamant. It has to be an individual reflection that no one else sees and, except for the instructor to be able to provide some type of you know, check mark or assessment that they did it. That it really needs to be a personal experience. And the fact when you open it up to a broader audience, then people start to edit, self-edit, and they don't want to say everything that they're really experiencing. So that, that's one school. 
Then you have others that, let's make it semi-private. So you have your personal journal and then maybe the parts of it that you share in summary. And then I know Alex is probably, Alex, you're probably the public, right? <laughs> and I know in her classes she likes to open things up as much as possible to get feedback from, uh, from peers and, and others. And so you kind of have to gauge the room. You have to see what's most appropriate for your students, uh, what's most appro appropriate for the class. Again, confidentiality, you may not be in a position where you want to put it out on the open internet exactly what your students are doing because you have agreements on that you're going to keep some things uh, quiet or private. And so these, these are things you need to think about. I don't necessarily have a prescriptive answer to give you on what it should be. And so finally, tying this all together, um, the, the assessment piece, piece, which is a really important question. Again, tying it all back to this idea of the course contract being your rubric. And so you're going to be looking at the student's process, what did their work product look like, um, and what did their uh, re reflections tell you about, um, about what they did. And you can pretty, you know, very easily tell if they actually engaged. Uh, it's easy because, like I said, the ones that really engage will tell you how messy it was, that they didn't know what they were doing, <laughs> and things went out of control. The students who kind of just gloss through it will tell you, it was great and nothing happened bad. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. And so you can pretty quickly tell um, for, through reading the reflections what, what actually went on. And so I wanted to just kind of close in terms of my, uh, the people that I spoke with. Uh, this is an awesome person. I never met her face to face, but her name is Maureen Berry. So if there are any librarians or information science people in the room, she's running a service learning conference for librarians coming up. And so if you want to follow along with some of the work she's doing, she's at Wright State University. I just found her from the Twitter, you know, Twitter feed, and I asked her to come on and talk to me. And so she has some really cool perspectives on things you can do uh, for service learning way outside the realm of what I've already talked about. Mine is kind of my little, my experiences are very much within the instructional design community. But if you're all interested in hearing some of the cool things that she has been involved with, um, she's very inspirational and I, I, you know, highly encourage you to, to follow along with her. She's on Twitter. And so the, the how, um, again, I'm talking to a group of faculty instructional designers. It's all the same. You, know, you can get peer input if it's a group project. Client input makes sense if it's, uh, you know, you'd want to make sure you understand from the client's perspective how did things go. And then I always ask the students to do a self-evaluation. How do you think you did? And um, I usually keep that, um, you know, fairly informal, not a huge part of their grade, but I do like to get them to tell me how they thought they did. And so that kind of concludes my roster. For those of you that have done service learning or are listening to this for the first time and you're all instructional designers, what are some of the gaps or what are some of the things that you would add to or change or augment? Anything, um, anything that I didn't cover or I should be thinking of? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you use the mic? Oh, wait. I guess um, the, I'm just wondering, is there ever a forum where they get to um, show off what they did or? <sighs> That kind of thing? Yes. Is that, is that the did. blog? or uh, That's sort I of did. like a work in okay. progress kind of thing. No, that's awesome. So um, for my class that I had, uh, the last two nights of the class were uh, demos. So we had to come in and share with the, the rest of the class. And I actually had an evaluation form. So kind of your traditional instructional design, uh, about looking at the types of things that we look at. And um, I asked the students, it was, I, I did, used a survey monkey. So as the students were presenting uh, using Adobe Connect, um, they were able to do it. I was able to compile all the feedback from their peers. And so that ties into what I was uh, mentioning before as far as the, um, the what, that it was the student's product. And so uh, they had my two cents when I graded it on what I th how they thought they did. But then they also had the ability to share and compare. Um, and that was really cool, actually. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. Some of the really, I had a real quiet student who was a first semester master's student just coming out of her bachelor, scared to death, thinking that she was in this room full of, virtual room full of PhD students, and she completely came out of her shell because she realized she helped. And she actually was working with, um, with a nonprofit, and it was really fun to watch. And I would say her presentation of her, her product was probably one of the strongest because she really got into it, and you could tell. Um, you could tell. But yeah, that's a great question as well. And then um, with the, the group I'm working with right now, that's a huge thing we're thinking about. We call it our home base. Where are you going to put your de deliverables? So as you're creating your instructional design products, where I can give you feedback, we have a Google Plus community, we have all sorts of things like that, um, how, how we can showcase it so we can get the show and tell feed, feedback coming back. So, anything else? Oh, yeah. 
the first time that I worked with a faculty member in service learning was about 10 years ago. And he did something like you described. It was a volunteer experience. He got them out there involved in the community around the discipline that he was teaching. And he wanted to write an article and publish on it. So we actually did it using the student journals. One of his outcomes for the course was that they would value the service learning experience. And so being an affective outcome, it's a little bit harder for to measure that. So we actually did a content analysis on the student journals and were able to then identify keywords that would represent different levels of the taxonomy for the affective domain. And then tallied it up in terms of frequencies and ran a chi-square on it and were actually able to come up with some numbers. And he had, he was fortunate that he had several sections a uh, section where it wasn't required, it was optional, sections where it was required. And so we had different uh, control groups to look at. And it was really interesting to be able to actually quantify and see how students were following along that affective domain. Yeah, and you bring up, that's an awesome segue. Also, I should have mentioned, for the researchers in the group that are looking for things, this is a wealth of information. They're producing deliverables, they're producing reflections. And so if you kind of play your cards right, and you think of things beforehand as a way to set up an IRB to be able to study it, it's, it's a great way to do that. And I'd love to see, so was that published then, the actual? Yeah. yeah. Can you put in the comments section on that? Sure. That would be awesome. I'd love to, love to follow up. Yeah, go ahead. I just want, Nancy, yes. can you use the mic? You have to turn it on. Turn it on, sorry. That's, that's, um, I just wanted to share. Uh, it's, as you were talking about journaling and reflection, some of the success we've had with service learning and even internships with the use of electronic portfolio. Um, I know you said in a blog or whatever, but we've been able, it, it seems like the tool uh, organizes the process so you can track the students from the, the start, the inquiry process, onto reflection in the next level. But what's nice is a, it organizes the student also and organizes the feedback coming in for the mentors. But what's interesting, we have the employers or the nonprofits that are also in to they can see the process where the students at and supply feedback and maybe look at, we found that the employers are looking at things that maybe the students, confidential confidentiality issues and just seems like a nice little package and the students can carry it with them. And, and I think um, almost all the students that, when I asked them their feedback, they said they were definitely, it, most of them were, well not most, some were going out on, doing interviews, and they said this was part, they were just taking what they'd done in class, they were sitting down at yeah. their interview, and, and then they had you know, a prototype. Because part of this their resume, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, and it, this is a perfect segue. How much time do I have? Uh, nine minutes, okay, perfect. So if you wouldn't mind pointing your browsers to, let's see. Uh, I'm using a Google Sites. We're working with a nonprofit who has no money, and we needed to have discussion boards, and we needed all sorts of th <coughs> all sorts of things. So you point your browser to sites.google.com/site, OER for CCR. And so for any of those folks that work in adult basic education, you're probably familiar with the College and Career Readiness Standards. So what we're working on um, it's a pretty fun project that I just kicked off on the 15th of February. 23 college students from 15 different instructional design project programs. So we have 19 college mentors from, nine, uh, from 15 different um, college, uh, from programs. So I put out a call for volunteers, 100% virtual. It's working with a nonprofit in Michigan that's a rehab facility for homeless individuals. And part of the requirement of being um, able to stay in the program, it's a residential program, is that you make progress toward your GED if you don't have a high school degree. And so the GED, for those of you that may be familiar in this room, I know we have some community college folks may be familiar, the GED test changed significantly from um, the prior version to the 2014 version. And so they have no resources to, to work with their clients. And so my students are working on five different projects. I call them my students. 
I've never met most of them, <laughs> actually. I wouldn't know them if they walked in right now. It's all, been, uh, it's all virtual. Uh, but the, uh, the idea is that we have one group working on a mapping and mining project. So your English students would probably be great for this. They're going out and looking at the universe of open educational resources that are already developed by major funders, Gates Foundation, MacArthur, whoever it may be, Khan Academy. Um, and seeing what's out there for the K-12 audience. And we're trying to figure out uh, the good ones. So they're trying to do some type of evaluation and assessment on the quality of the resources they're finding. And then mapping them to the, um, the, the career, college and career readiness standards. So that's one group. Then there's three groups that are um, going to create exemplar units. So it, it, the idea is that we, they're trying to get chunks of one hour instruction with a tutor and um, make them again available for, as open educational resources. So we're gonna have three exemplars and we're gonna have a home base where this will, uh, our, our version of what things should look like. Then there's a, a fifth group that's working on computers for learning. The GED test is now um, only being taught on computers, no longer paper and pencil. We're working with um, a lot of learners who've never touched a computer for learning purposes. Maybe they know how to use Facebook, maybe they've used Twitter, or whatever it may be. But they've certainly never taken a written essay and a timed, uh, a timed essay or um, whatever it may be on the G GED test. So there's a, a, a fifth group that's then creating a module to help them understand what they're going to experience when they start preparing for the, um, the GED test. And so, again, as I said, everything that we're creating is being thrown back in the universe, universe as open educational resources. And so this project started on the 15th. It's running 11 weeks. And so I, I really love it, this being a huge group of instructional designers and faculty. Follow along. We have a, a Google Plus page. Um, we're using Google Groups, which um, just to keep things manageable, uh, the right capabilities are, is for only folks on the project. But you do have the ability to read and, um, and then use the Google Plus community to add your comments. We've got, we're using Twitter hashtag, OERCCR, uh, we have a Facebook page. Um, and so the idea being, um, get students from across the country, there are, as I said, uh, 15 different instructional design programs, um, and we're going to see what happens. And we're right in the middle of it, we're right at the very messy stage, students don't know, they think they know what, they know what they're doing, but now when they're actually getting into the devil, the details, my inbox is filled with, you know, well, what, are the, <laughs> what types of OER are you looking for? Because OER, it's a pretty broad, are you talking about something that's only been created and vetted by uh, something funded by Gates Foundation, or could it be something that I just happen to find on the internet that looks interesting? So anyway, it's, it's all those devil in the details type things that we're, we're smack dab in the middle of. So feel free to follow along, and does anyone in this room work with adult basic education and um, at all? No? Adult basic education, so um, basically prepping folks for GED tests and uh, or, or whatever the uh, high school equivalency may be. So, no, nope. okay. Well, if you are at all interested, you can follow along. Um, and that's all I had. So, any any other questions? Oh yeah, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. That was a very interesting. Uh, presentation. Uh, the College of Business at Stony Brook, we've done service learning for about 40 years through internships and industry project courses that sound very much like face-to-face -face versions of what you do online. And we have two really distinct issues that come up all the time. Uh, once you introduce the client into, the, into a course, you now run the risk that the client fails. Yeah. And that leaves the student in a vulnerable position. How do you Two questions here. How do you evaluate the student when the client fails? And the second question is, um, what happens to the relationship between the university and the client when the students fail? I mean, these both happen. We have to be honest about it. Yeah. So we're very concerned that we don't want to ruin relationships with clients, bridges, yeah. right? That people never want to come back to Stony Brook yeah. again. Uh, but we're also worried about being fair to the students when in reality the client didn't do what they were supposed to do, dis despite any memorandum of uh, understanding yeah. or whatever. No, they have no control over the client. So I I'm had, curious about your comments. I've had all those examples, all of the above. Um, I had a poor student um, doing a great job working with, it was Norfolk, he was working with the, um, uh, some community group that was trying to set up a bike program. And so everything was all excited. He, excited, he was excited, the client was excited, and then the person he was working with, uh, who was also a volunteer, stopped working on the project, and so that we didn't have a contact anymore. And so we made it a teachable moment when things go <laughs> haywire, you make it a teachable moment, and you say, that's what happens in life. I've been fired from projects, and you have to 
you know, hop up, dust yourself up, and you find another client. And so in that case, I worked with him offline a lot. We found him another client. It was a great relationship. It he was uh, coming into instructional design from a career in restaurant management. So he literally went back to the place he used to work at and started working on their workflow within the um, like kind of an onboarding people as they come into the restaurant. So we had to think quickly, and uh, it was messy for everybody involved. Uh, but it happens, and it's, it's a risk of, of doing this, but you, again, try to make it as much as you can a teachable moment. The other part, burning bridges, is a huge issue, and I, I mentioned, if I can find it quickly, um, Rick Schweer talked about that a lot. Um, he's somewhere in here, uh, in the first session, and that's why some of the folks that I talked with wanted to be in control of setting up the relationship, because they wanted to handpick the client, make sure the students were doing what they were doing, uh, because, so they knew what was happening, so they didn't burn, burn the bridges. Um, but that's really where the project management comes into play, that you have to be able to make sure that your students are doing what they promised to deliver. And it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. And again, I'm making this sound like a great woohoo, this is awesome. This is way harder to teach this way. Much more time consuming. Um, but tying back to my whole thing, be a good girl, have a good time, and learn a lot. If that's what you want for your students, this is, what you, this is the amount of effort it takes. We all know that. This is not shocking to this group. Um, and so you kind of get the good with the bad, and you have to embrace the bad and, and hopefully turn it into something positive. Um, but so far, I haven't had any clients that we've really been unable. Although, in speak, I won't name names. In speaking, and it's on, <laughs> she was on the recording of one of these, saying that she did have a, a group completely drop the ball. And so she felt so committed to the nonprofit and wanted to work with them in the future, she did the, the work. She finished the client, the, the student's work. So. You know, it's the risk you, you take. You're going to kick me off the stage. Do you want to hand out these? Um, oh, that's okay. It's um, not fine. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Jen. <laughs> Jen's going to be with us. Oh, yeah. Jen, you can hand these out. It's okay. We can hand these out. Um, uh, so thank you for um, an excellent presentation. Um, if you have additional questions, Jen's going to be with us um, for the rest of the conference. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, uh, it's lunchtime, and I, I can actually smell it out there. Um, it's that way where uh, lunch was yesterday. It's a warm lunch today, not a boxed lunch. And as I mentioned this morning, if you weren't here, um, they're asking us not to eat our warm lunch in this room. Um, so, um, you can leave your stuff here. Everything will be fine. Um, and grab your lunch. And there are a couple of different places uh, out there where you can sit. Uh, on the third floor, there is a little cafe, so you can get your food and go sit up there, wherever it is that you would, uh, that you'd like to, um, you know, find a spot, just to have a seat. I'd also like to um, remind you to find the Newton board members. There's, um, I don't know, I think there's 20 or so of them here that are joining us for lunch. Um, that that's the National University Technology Network board that's here. And um, I'd like you to introduce yourself to them. This is your homework. Um, and find out a little bit about them and, um, and uh, what they're doing uh, with online learning at their campuses. Um, and um, we are back here at 1 o'clock sharp. Um, to begin our celebrations um, and for our keynote address uh, with the Chancellor. So I will see you back here at 1. Thank you.